Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Cameron Brune. I'm the Dean of Architecture and Head of School at the UQ School of Architecture, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Um, some of you know, and some of you will be experiencing for the very first time, this is the School of Architecture's new CBD satellite space. Um, we're calling it satellite, but I'm welcome to hear any other thoughts about other names we might call it. Um, Theatre has also come to mind. Um, this is a great new asset for the School of Architecture at UQ um, and is designed for events just like the one we're going to experience tonight. Um, tonight's event is part of the Bad Festival, which is currently underway across Brisbane um, with a focus on the CBD um, this weekend. This is the second architecture and event, the first one presented at the Museum of Brisbane. This series is curated by Isabella Reynolds, um, a Master of Architecture student at the University of Queensland, who also works at BVN. So to get tonight underway, it's my great pleasure to introduce Izzy, um, and she will begin this evening's conversation by introducing our panelists. So once again, thank you very much for joining us this evening, and I hope you enjoy tonight's conversation about construction technology and architecture. Thank you, Izzy. Thanks very much, Cameron. And thanks also to our panellists, guests and partners in the event. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Jagera and Turrbal people on whose lands and waters we meet, learn and grow, and whose elders, past, present and emerging, maintain a connection to country and from whom we can learn much about coexistence, building, listening and making. Events like this are made possible by invested collaborators, including the Museum of Brisbane, the Bad Festival and the School of Architecture, in particular, Lisa, Cecilia and Cameron. We're also very grateful for the generosity of our panellists and participants. Thank you for being here today. The conditions of the world require us to reflect on the conditions of our practice. The current cultural and environmental situation is strained under the compounding weight of decades of overspecification and concrete waste. Current economic theory is guided by technological and economic growth but with increasingly limited resources and escalating public concern, accountability must reorient intention and ambition. What does a sustainable future look like? The built product is the enduring document of the people who produce it, and the process requires as much attention as the product itself. <coughs> so architecture and construction technology is about architecture as a building process, how we build the structures that we're left with, what they're made of, who it profits, and how new technologies can help. The Architecture AND series was born out of a need to have meaningful conversations between the discipline of architecture and the disciplines that influence and intersect it. I started the series with a lot of questions. Why do we continue to make materially consumptive buildings? Can industrial technology be utilised sustainably? These pragmatic questions are essential, but I also want to know how the future will impact our aesthetic heritage. Can new tech construction technologies continue the dialogue of history and craft established by the handmade? When our buildings look like Revit models, are people or algorithms leading design? No doubt you have questions too, so please write them down or keep them in your mind until the end of the discussion when we'll open the floor for a Q&A. At this point, I would like to thank and introduce Kim Baber, who will be acting as our panel chair to facilitate tonight's discussion. Kim's influence is broad and deeply generous to the profession across <coughs> architectural practice, research and education. Kim is a practicing architect, founder and principal at Baber Studio, which has been awarded the Queensland Emerging Architect Prize by the Australian Institute of Architects. He's also a part-time research fellow at the University of Queensland in the schools of architecture and civil engineering, a Gottstein Trust fellow and a member of the Future Timber Hub Research Centre, funded by the Australia Research Council. As a part of his practice and research, he's interested in how we can make better buildings from carbon neutral and renewable material in our cities. Please welcome Kim. I invite you guys to take a seat on stage. Thanks very much, Isabella. We'll all come up here. Thank you for the introduction and thanks to Cameron and obviously thanks to, to the School of Architecture and Big thanks to the organisers. This is a, a really exciting thing to be part of, and uh, I'm looking forward to a robust conversation tonight. We've got some really great guests here tonight. I'll, I'll introduce them one by one. 
starting with Lachlan Nielsen. Uh, Lachlan, or Lockie, as I know him. Uh, Lockie uh, is, is part of uh, Nielsen Jenkins, the architectural practice. This is a, a, an award-winning practice um, based in Brisbane. The work of your practice explores key ideas about landscape, subtraction, connections and materiality in order to achieve client-specific outcomes that are responsive to context and place. These explorations form the basis of all of your work, from residential and commercial architecture to furniture construction and design. And I believe um, you also actually build, build some of your projects and, in fact, build some of the furniture that goes into them. So you've got a huge um, set of skills that you can draw upon. Um, the work of the practice has been published and awarded broadly in Australia. In 2018, Nielsen Jenkins was awarded the Queensland Emerging Architecture Prize. Current projects are underway in, I understand, suburban, coastal and rural sites throughout the country in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. So welcome, Lockie. Uh, our next guest tonight is Matthew Miller. Um, Matt is the general manager of uh, Dexas in Queensland and heads up project leasing. With the responsibility for leadership of the Dexas office in Queensland and all major leasing assignments across the Queensland portfolio. Matt has 30 years experience in the property industry, including roles with some of the country's leading property companies, including Len Lease, Grocon, FKP, Urbis, and Colliers International, to name a few. Matt is a former board member of Brisbane City Council's inclusive Brisbane Board, South Bank Corporation, and the Urban Land Development Authority. He was president of the Committee for Brisbane from 2010 to 2012, and currently sits on the Queensland Division Council of the Property Council of Australia. So welcome, Matt. Uh, Lisa Ottenhouse. Uh, Lisa is a, a structural engineer and a lecturer at the School of Engineering, University of Queensland. Lisa's research has centred on timber structures. They undertook a PhD at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand, researching connections in tall timber buildings, and also holds a master's at T TU Delft, focusing on geodesic bamboo domes. Lisa's current research focus is on off-site manufacture, and transitioning the construction industry towards a circular framework. Th this research is interdisciplinary by nature and involves collaboration with colleagues from the University of Queensland School of Architecture, as well as several national and international collaborators and PhD and MPhil students. Welcome, Lisa. Uh, we'll also welcome Ben Tate. Ben is a partner at Urban Art Projects, having been based uh, in their US studio, in fact, founding the, the US studio in New York. Uh, he's been there for the last six years, but has only recently just returned to Australia. Uh, and he's, he's been working out of their Brisbane studio where, where, in fact, Urban Art Projects was founded. As a partner in the business, Ben performs a group-wide role overseeing a range of strategic projects for UAP. In particular, Ben is responsible for driving UAP's digital transformation across the, I understand, across the world. This strategic project encompasses the incorporation of advanced manufacturing technologies into their operation, as well as facilitating collaborations between client groups, university and universities and fellow industry partners. So welcome, Ben. So I thought we'd get started tonight by really looking at where the question is about how architecture relates to construction, how construction and construction technology informs the way that we practice architecture. So the, the big thing here that we're focusing on is the and part, the architecture and construction. So I'd like to, to start by putting forward a, a proposition. Uh, when we think about the history of architecture, the way that a building reveals its construction, uh, exposes the parts, exposes the way in which it's made, has long been a, a really expressive and, and powerful way to not only think about architecture, but 
the way that we experience architecture. With the current prevalence for buildings to cover everything up, to apply finishes, conceal construction, do we still have this opportunity, opportunity for the construction to become an expressive element within architecture? And I'd like to perhaps start by asking the architect in the, the audience, uh, in the panel. So, Lockie. Well, I, I think it's an interesting question. Our, our practice has always been interested in expressing materiality. Um, it seems very apparent at the moment with labour costs and construction costs soaring in the country, and we're actually trying to get rid of labour offsite and, and, and uh, the amount of trades, and if we can shorten the building contract, how we can save money through that. Um, we've also got a couple of projects in bushfire areas at the moment, and so the applied finishes, the, what you're working with in a Bal 40 is... is a pretty limited palette of materials, you know, whether it's concrete or galvanised steel or glass, there's some certain types of timber, but it's actually on a couple of projects forced our hand into into reducing the amount of elements on a construction site, which is quite fascinating and the way that people are responding is actually very interesting. Um, we thought we'd be sort of pulling people through it, but they, they've responded really well to reducing the palette and, and expressing the materialities. Um, it also allows us in our practice to ground buildings where you know if you don't render block work, plants can grow over. You know you can see waterproofing membranes. You can also see where termites are, so you can sort of monitor some of those things as well. But there's also that that sort of timelessness of materiality too, and, and not hiding what it is. Mm. Uh, and so there's there's both that sense of it being uh, a rational way to build. There's also a frugality in that, isn't there? Definitely. Definitely, and, and just a, a reduction, and, and you know, it, it just seems so apparent at the moment. Like we're trying to, we're, we're, we've got a couple of projects where we're literally re trying to reduce the length of the, of the contract, and and if we can save on labour, then we can detail it differently so that materials that are coming from offsite or aren't coming at all at the moment, there's there's shortages in timber. Um, if we can reduce that and, and finesse it, then we can spend time on the finessing of materials and, and that expression. But um, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. And so when you're talking to clients about this very notion of expressing structure, uh, revealing the way things are made, mm. it's not only about a, a, a rationale or a, a, a way to be frugal, but what about the experience? I mean, obviously, this is a, a core part of your architecture in the way that you think not only about new buildings, but also when you're renovating an, exi an existing building, uh, you, you kind of celebrate being able to, to, to let the building reveal what it used to be, how it was made. Definitely. And so do you want to talk a little bit about the way that you might approach working on, say, a, a, you know, renovation of an old Queensland house and, and that, that, that sense that that you really can kind of bring back its former character by, by literally peeling things off. Yeah, um, there is a lot of that. Like everyone has this love affair with sort of Queenslanders, but they usually in the course of the last 80, 100 years have been bastardised or added or, in, and, and so our work often focused on subtraction and that's basically stripping it back to what it was before. And, and a lot of these buildings are timber buildings in this humidity that have been here for 80 to 100 years, the timbers, the flooring still the original, the frame still the original. Most of the um, the weatherboards and chamfer boards are, are, are still there, and and you know some of them still have the original roofs. Um, so it is interesting, sort of getting it back to what it was, and then adding other elements of materiality. Like we do struggle with some of the express materials, especially exposed block work, as such, because. The connotations with some buildings, like, you know, everyone just thinks of an 80s toilet block when you say we're going to use exposed block work everywhere, but um, I think there is a, a lot more projects using expressive materials, like brick at the moment seems to be quite popular, but there's always these social connotations with, with certain types of materiality and, and you know, the, the, the amount of sort of imagery you can get nowadays. and, and We've had this ability to be able to take people through these projects and, and say, well, that's concrete block and that's concrete floors and, and this is expressed steel. And it's just about trying to re-educate people to sort of accept 
but we don't need to render things, we don't need mm -hmm. to paint it, we don't need to cover everything back up again. Um, and so, I'm sure you do beautiful block work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're working at a, obviously, a, at a range of scales, but predominantly at, at the smaller scale, residential homes and, and small commercial fit-outs. Matt, how, how do you go about um, selling to a potential tenant, a potential client, the idea that you might expose a concrete frame or a, a timber frame, as in the projects that you've been recently involved in, well, how, do, how do you find the reception um, within your clientele? Well, it's mixed, Kim. It's certainly mixed. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of organisations that we deal with that the commercial aspects of the deal are paramount. So whether or not you've got the best looking building in Brisbane or not, at the end of the day, it's the economics. But I suppose if you if you go back in time, and it's not that far far ago that uh, you know Richard Rogers did that on a massive scale when it came to the Lloyds building in the city of London, like express the whole structure of the building on the outside. So there there is a template there, and and I, I was I was obviously very fortunate to be involved with the first engineered timber office building delivered in Brisbane down at uh, the Brisbane Showgrounds, mm -hmm. and we were also very fortunate to have a partner i.e. the occupant, which is Oricon at the time, that were very keen to be involved in um, you know, uh, a very unique project. So that certainly help, helped us a lot because there was certainly um, an economic penalty to deliver that product. Because when we went to the building, when we, we, not, not so much our building, you know, Lendley's building had some experience in building timber structures, but when we went to the local trades, they didn't quite understand, you know, how they were going to deliver this. At the end of the day, we ended up going to a carpentry group that ended up delivering the whole structure around the timber building. So you can understand at the start of the process when we're trying to lock in a building price with a tenant that was prepared to pay a certain rent and an investor that was prepared to pay a certain price, there was a fair bit of risk built into the building price. Um, and we went on a journey with all those subbies who, who were very... They'd never done this before. We went on a journey with those subbies and they had a great experience. And we, interestingly, were able to deliver that, that, that building 15 weeks earlier than a normal concrete structure. Um, we had two first aid instances over a 15-month period. And ironically, those two first aid instances were when we were doing the concrete component of the, the building, not when we were doing the timber. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great outcome for everyone that was involved. So I think that gave us a lot of confidence that there was a fantastic opportunity to continue with this type of construction. Unfortunately for us, um, at that period of time, like about six months after we completed that building, we're, we're in the market trying to entice another, interestingly, a big resources company that thought maybe occupying a timber building might have been good for their brand. But unfortunately, we just ran into this you know, economic roadblock, which was the price had gone up enormously. We weren't producing the timber here at a critical mass stage uh, so it was very difficult to, to take it to the next level but generally I think we all came away from that experience thinking there is a great opportunity here to use alternative materials to make sure that we ex do express the structure or, or express the architecture through a commercial building and there are there are users out there there are occupants out there that, that want to play a part in that. Mm -hmm. um, we might come back to the issue of cost later in the conversation because it certainly is one that's at the forefront of a, a lot of practitioners' minds at the moment. But um, can you explain a little bit more about, um, since the building's been occupied, um, what are the reports about the way that people use that interior? It is a commercial office building. Anecdotally, what are you hearing from, from the users about you know, this, this exposed timber, the expression of the structure, because it, it, like I say, it's, it's, it's quite un uncommon. It's also uncommon for it to be timber, being the first one in Brisbane, but yeah. even the idea of it exposing the, the, the bones of the building, um, what are people saying that they it, actually use the space? Kim, on the whole, it's very, very positive. Um, Oricon came out of a, a typical concrete um, structure in the city, um, and, 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 and a lot of their people were very concerned about moving out of the CBD to go to a near city location, but I think the building has played an enormous part in them getting a, a, a 
great satisfaction out of being involved in a building which is the first of its kind. And Oricon have been a great advocate for um, not only you know timber being you know a form of material we should use going forward, but also a place, also a material that can really drive a culture around a workplace. So. Mm -hmm. 2020 aside, where a lot of people had to go home and, and, and not use the workplace, prior to that, they, they, their, their satisfaction levels, um, the, the, the surveys they were conducting with their people, were they, they, they were off the charts. Mm -hmm. They were really, really happy with the way that the, that the building um, was performing from them. And, and, and I know when we had inspections with you know, other organisations, there's a real warmth about timber. It's a very different feel when you come out of a lift and you go into a timber floor and you got a timber ceiling, you know, it's, it's a much different feel that there's a smell, for starters, uh, unlike concrete, which is pretty bland. Um, we've just found that, that that was very much appreciated and, and, and it was a point of difference, there's no doubt. That's why that was part of the reason we did We At Lend Lease, they were always at the forefront of trying to come up with new construction techniques. Environmentally, it was also very, very important. Um, interestingly, we went on a very long journey with the QFERS, mm -hmm. uh, and to their credit, they were they were very engaged and were interested. Um, but they did really set the bar very high for us in terms of fire performance. Mm -hmm. So much so that um, you know we had a relationship with the University of Queensland where we were testing the beams and the burn time. And, and ironically, the way that we designed all the structure was that effectively the first seven mils of those beams and structures they would burn very quickly, but it took a very long time to get through the actual structural integrity of the building. So um, it was almost a superior performance to, to concrete. So everyone was on board, everyone wanted to make it work, but they were setting the bar high in terms of performance. And at the end of the day, I think it's a great outcome for, um, for the city. And I think it's a great model that we can roll out once we get those economies of scale right in terms of cost and price and the like. It's very interesting also that Oricon, um, being a, a multidisciplinary engineering uh, practice, is obviously going in there on the front foot, really wanting to be involved. Um, what I find really interesting about that is, um, I guess, just the, the responsibility that, that structural engineers are now taking to put forward these um, better ways of building in a sense. There's a whole range of reasons that you might use timber as an alternate material. Lisa, can you talk a little bit about the way that engineers might be changing their thinking about materials and about structure and, and taking that responsibility? Yeah, absolutely. So, obviously being a structural timber engineer, this is what I do. And um, 25 King is really a great example of, of that done right but I think we're sort of seeing or I hope to what I hope to see is that engineering and architecture are moving closer together again so I've sort of seen the the notion that in a structural engineer would get the design from an architect and then has to verify that design and um, produce the calculations but I think by using materials such as timber, the engineer is much more involved in that design process. And it's interesting how some aspects of an engineered structure, like connection details, could actually become a design feature as well. Um, so I think or I hope that engineers are um, a bit more interested in design again and, and we do teach that as well at UQ so we, we have just started a Bachelor of Design where we're bringing these different aspects together engineering, architecture um, and, and just taking a holistic approach to designing a building and I think it's for that it's very important what we talk about in Timber is um, early engagement of all um, you know, of all the all the trades, of all the stakeholders, and everybody involved in the design process. So you would want to talk, which is interesting that you mentioned. You know, the availability. You would want to talk to your manufacturer really early on to make sure 
the product is available in the sizes that you specify. You want to be going on this design journey with the architect together. As you mentioned, you know, the, the beams that are oversized because you have a sacrificial lay char layer, which is a um, very common strategy to be able to expose timber. All those considerations need to be married in that design process to come up with um, you know, with a design that meets all the specifications. So I find it very interesting and I do collaborate a lot with architects, um, Kim included, and it's exciting. There's so much to learn from each other in, on, in and on that journey, mm. I think, yeah, definitely. So it's, it's very different to perhaps, like you mentioned, a, a process that, that perhaps we might be um, used to working in certainly the, the mode by which architects get the project to a certain point and kind of meet with the engineer and, and a lot of decisions have been made where a system is then specified like a system but it's not it's not really a system is it, it it's very much more like um, in fact how you might design a really large piece of joinery because you have to think about the way that each member is connected like a, a really large table or chair where every element is exposed and so like you say the the way that you design the connection is, is really important and so therefore you it, it's almost like kind of sitting down with a, a furniture maker a hundred years ago to work out how you might join you know, a chair <coughs> to, a, to a base so in that sense it really is quite different isn't it and uh, like you say you're involved from an early stage but um, how do you how do you find um, that that experience I mean it, it's it's certainly different to like looking up a span table for instance you're actually collaborating in the true sense yeah so I, I would say it has to be pretty organic excuse the pun there working with an organic material but it you know you really have to accept that there will be some learning on that journey you will have to learn a different language so that's something I find very exciting as an engineer talking to architects and trying to understand each other because we do communicate in different languages um, usually and, and the way we used to teach um, structural engineers, civil engineers and architects used to be very you know separate um, but by engaging with material like timber you will have to inevitably talk to each other right from the start and try to understand where the other person is coming from so it is it is a holistic process really where everybody needs to be involved right from the start including you know building performance hygroscopic performance timber is it takes up moisture it releases moisture so you have to think about your ability design you need to talk to um, your fire safety engineer early on so I think once you accept mm -hmm. that everybody at the table has an equally important voice and you start your design journey there you can come up with a much better outcome than in other projects where I've been involved where an engineer would get involved at a very late stage when the c certain decisions have been made which then have um, you know effects on on cost delivery time um, also knowing what can be done I think we touched on that as well what can be done off-site because there's so much time saving in off-site manufacture um, that can be capitalized on so if you talk to your manufacturer early on they often will come up with a solution or a design for you already through the experience that will prevent a lot of hiccups later on. So, so I think this, you know, it kind of, I think it ties in with how we should be doing construction and that is material independent actually, where we should all start to talk to each other much earlier in the design process to achieve better outcomes. Certainly. And 
Ben, that's actually not this process of being involved very, very early on. Um, UAP are known for, for making, for fabricating amazing uh, artwork, but also building components. And I suppose what's really set you apart from the very beginning is that you're actually not really just a fabricator. In fact, you're designers, you're engineers, you're curators. And you do actually get involved from very, very early on. So in that sense, your process is is not dissimilar in the sense that you're, you're working collaboratively with artists. Um, how do you find that relationship um, has changed? I mean, UAP's what, nearly 20, 20, 20, years. Yeah, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 28 years mm. old. So no, it's grown massively too. So is that a core reason why it's been so successful, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think I think um, the collaborative process that you're talking about is kind of part of our DNA, so we have to work that way. Um, you know, at working with an artist, our goal is really to, um, you know, their their uh, their um, how successful they believe the artwork in is, is is the paramount driver for everything we do. So, um, and we're often faced with uh, um, creative challenges that the artist. Um, doesn't fully understand the impact on the fabrication side, and so our responsibility is to kind of deliver what they're looking for, but solve all of those problems without them having to worry about the various technical issues. So to do that, we have to collaborate um, with our own internal teams, manufacturing from, from various sides of the, um, from various skill sets, but also the engineers outside of our office, the architectural, um, uh, the architectural team that is wanting to integrate the artwork. So there's a lot of cogs and pieces that have to be brought together and um, and you know so we've learned to do that in a very non-combative way and and getting in early is absolutely the critical factor every time it's it's how you um, keep every options available because you lose options as the doors shut over time yeah now obviously in, in UAP's uh, practice you work with a vast range of scales now, probably every material possible that, that can be turned into a, an artwork or a piece of structure. Um, when we think about this idea that, that construction can be expressed and can become a, a, a kind of core expressive part of architecture, material inevitably comes into that, the expression of, uh, of, a, of a real material in its authentic um, form is something that um, we, we really value and and also this idea that you can see the, the evidence of how something's made mm. obviously you guys do hand make some things are handmade but a lot mm. of things aren't yep. and, and certainly in our in our buildings these days we, we rarely see things that are handmade um, what do you think the future is for, for being able to see elements that are handmade are we just being nostalgic, wanting to see that? Um, how are you? How, how's UAP's um, um, transforming with with you know, new methods of fabrication? Yeah, I think there's um, there's kind of two. I was just thinking about the conversation going on. I think there's two aspects to that. Um, and I was thinking about um, you know how you might expose uh, a con a concrete as an as, as an expressive element. And so the way we would do that is to um, uh, take, take over or, or um, inject ourselves into a part of that manufacturer's workflow. So if we're working, for a, working with a concreter who's just really interested in pouring a lot of stuff quickly, um, we'll work with them on the mould part of it. So that's the kind of, really, that's the creative part of the process. And so now we're making that, um, it's not the whole workflow, but there's a small part of it that we can arrest and inter interact with creatively. And I think that's a really interesting, um, you know, uh, area to explore for architects is how they can, how they can mer merge and interfere with some parts of the workflow in a manufacturing sense. Um, and then a lot of the work we do is about um, the base, you know, we, we work in a very broad range of base metals. So uh, the beauty of the metal is a big part of the work. Um, and uh, particularly with sculptural stuff. So there's, you know, um, I remember that can flow over to an architectural context as well. 
and we've done um, you know very large expressive reception decks that are just mild steel and we clear coat them and it's about how, how you uh, you can't just grab a piece of um, milled mild steel it's, it'll look hideous so there's some treatment that has to be dealt with and that treatment is uh, collaboratively developed with the architect so it's, it's about interfering and injecting the creative process into the manufacturing process finding that right opportunity and certainly yeah. um, within architectural practice we obviously are always finding trying to find you know that that particular tradesperson who has the right wavelength mm. has the right way of thinking that will actually encourage you to come into their workshop and and actually be part of that process and and you know at some point uh, be able to uh, bring some either a, a kind of a, a, a personal uh, inflection upon what they're doing as part of the process or, or also to to be able to um, to actually gain some more knowledge about how that particular process works so certainly when when we think about uh, construction technology it's um, the, the term technology suggests that it is this uh, it's all about the tech but in fact it's it's really all about the knowledge isn't it the set the huge mm -hmm. wealth of, of of knowledge that uh, all of those traits people bring to the project what are you finding in in you know in the last 15 years there's a huge um, transformation in the way that building components are, are made in terms of off-site manufacture prefabrication and now you know, robotic construction off-site. This is a big part of what you're doing, Ben, at mm. UAP. Um, what do you see the future being for uh, both architects, um, designers, makers, artists, and the way in which they might, you know, the, 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 act, the, the act of making things might fundamentally change? Do you mm. see digital manufacture fundamentally changing the way that designers practice yeah I think so I think um, I think with all as with all technology um, you know it, it, it inevitably becomes part of the suite of tools and so um, and I think robotics will will go that way um, over time but I think the I think there's a couple of things couple of dynamics that will change in the in our, our industry over the next 20 years and I think um, design and construction will start to collapse in closer together and I think that's really critical um, because and I and that's what technology has to offer the design community so a much more direct connection with the fabrication process and um, that's easy to do in an off-site context than it is on-site um, and then the other thing is that um, there's a lot of conversation about uh, the cost of labor soaring and I've done I've done a lot of study in this area and what's really interesting is that um, the cost of labor is really just going up it's just going up with CPI so it's not actually soaring mm. but what's happening I believe is that um, the market has an expectation that is growing uh, in line with iPhones and driving mm. self-driving vehicles and it, the expectation is um, following the average productivity trends of all other industries and construction's productivity is, is um, sta stagnant or dropping over the last 30 years. And so the only way, to, everyone thinks it's about the rising cost of labour, but it's actually that we just don't produce enough per labour hour. So I think technology, the role of technology is to basically um, ensure that uh, it's about just producing more. It's, it's not about working more, it's about working smarter and being able to produce more. And so I think people who make things by hand will just have their ability to make more stuff by hand. So um, one of the things we're doing in our workshop is um, we found that uh, the style of robot arm that makes more sense to us are that what they call cobots, which mm -hmm. which can work at a very closely with humans in a in a safe way. So you can't you can't walk in in Australia or anyway, you can in the US, strangely, but you can't walk in and stand next to a you know, a, a, a six metre robot arm, they're, it's all blocked off and there are all sorts of rules about going into that space because they can crush you. So, but these smaller robots can't and they stop when they touch you 
And so we're looking at investing into um, a bank of uh, smaller robots that can basically mimic what our finish is doing. And so in that way, we're, we're um, maintaining a, a handmade process, but we're expanding what that one person can do. And I think that's what construction has to do just to catch up with the expectation of the market. So when we think about the, I guess, the increase in automation in construction, the idea that we're potentially able to manufacture building elements uh, with robots, one of the, I guess, um, one of the hopes would be that that's going to make building cheaper. Um, but there's a, obviously there's a huge investment in all of that uh, equipment up front. Do you really see, and perhaps this is a question for you, Matt, do you really see um, you know, prefabrication and off-site manufacture having the ability to, to affect the cost of buildings and, and make them more affordable? Kim, I think we can flip that on its head. I, we spend tens of millions of dollars a year on fit-outs, office refurbishments, brand new office buildings. And we're, we're, we're always thinking about who are the best designers to get in the room to help us on our journey. So um, bespoke and handmade to me is really important. I don't think it's been more important than it is right now. And I think, you know, where we're sitting every day, we're thinking about who are the best people to have in the room with us to deliver the best outcome. So that might fly in the face of robotics and, and, and modular construction and all those sorts of things. So I think you've got to flip it around and say, when all that when all those systems can produce the handmade stuff, mm. then we're going to be on the right journey because I don't think my experience with modular, and I think we talked about this in the meeting before we had the meeting, um, was the problem is is that we're building these beautiful timber buildings, but they all look exactly the same. So when does the great design elements come into them? And that's to me, that's how you got to flip it around. Mm. You know, robotics, AI, whatever you want to call it, that. That's going to be worthwhile when those guys or those systems can get design, mm. because we don't all want to live in the same looking house or apartment building or office building or shopping centre. Bespoke has never been more important than it is today. And I know that what we do every day is that we talk about who are the right designers that we should have in the room with us, and then that's the starting point. It's not how cheap can we deliver this thing, how great a design can we deliver. So just on that then, I mean when we think about um, say uh, prefabricated housing for instance, um, Lisa I know that some of the work that you do and some of your researchers do is, is looking at as looking at prefabrication. What do you see some of the challenges being for that to be taken up in the market. I mean, one of the concerns that we might have, even if it might be, there might be some uh, cost efficiencies achieved in the off-site manufacturer facility, do they necessarily get passed on to the consumer? That's, yeah, it's a really interesting topic because the, the biggest roadblock is ac actually, it's two things. One is legislation. So a building certifier has to certify plumbing on site. If you've got a completely finished module, how, how are you going to do that? You can't. So what we see is a lot of people, a lot of manufacturers are not achieving the finishing that they could because their walls need to be accessible and, and visible. And there's ways around that, but it's just a matter of, you know, they, the, the manufacturers have talk to, they say the certifier comes three times um, in the factory <laughs> because the, before it goes off on site, just through the steps necessary in the process. The, the other problem is, um, is sort of like the, the risk and the liability side of things. And again, it's in how we, how those processes work in terms of, um, you might payments that are made uh, and a lot of that is again tied to certain stages reached on site but now that's happening off site. So I think there's a, there's a lot of catching up to do in terms of um, regulation, legislation and financial models. That's one side of the things. The other topic that you touched on is, is it all going to look the same? 
And the answer to that surprisingly is actually no, it's not because we we have what's called mass customization, which means even though you are manufacturing off-site, digital design allows you to have different designs um, that still fit within high output and high productivity. So that's actually really exciting that you could come up, you can come up with you know, your computer model runs in the background as you're coming up with the craziest shapes you could possibly imagine. And within, you know, a, the, the, a blink of an eye, you know whether that's structurally feasible or not. So I see opportunities. I see modern methods of construction as an opportunity to do those things. It's a, it's a tool. We just have to use it properly. And I think what we've seen in the past and why prefab is almost a swear word in, in the um, building industry is we've done it wrong. We had, you know, uh, prefab schools, mining accommodation, terrible quality, um, I wouldn't even call it architecture, most of that, it's a, it's a shoebox, right? And it's, it's hot, it's poorly designed, um, and we have to move away from that idea that that's what prefab um, will look like and really embrace this suite of tools that, that we have now and yeah so so I'm working with some great partners we're actually running a design competition at the moment um, that's part of one of the courses we teach at UQ in, in architecture and I'm teaching into that uh, where, where it's all around uh, you know off-site manufacture adaptive reuse and coming up with um, these wonderful and marvelous structures that can be transformed through different use cycles, they can adapt, we are reincorporating materials that have been used before, we're reclaiming part of the structure, we're integrating that whole design into an existing structure of architectural value where we're exposing you know, the, the trusses and the um, and the steel frames and the brickwork. So I think we just have to free ourselves from this idea that off-site manufacture work um, looks a certain way and it's all going to be these boxes that we stack on top of each other. That's just not true. So, so then presumably what you're setting up at UAP is in mm -hmm. fact, like, it's fair to say everything that you do at UAP is bespoke and that's why people come to you. So you're implementing these technologies. Mm -hmm. and is it fair to say that this is what you're doing? You're actually Absolutely, using the yeah. technology for everything to be different, but you're getting the, yeah. I guess the, um, you're, you're getting the benefits of this automation. Yeah, that's that's definitely um, that's definitely where the value of, uh, of of the of the digital movement is. Is this this notion of mass um, customization? So we're moving on into the. Um, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, if you like, is really all about that, and that's that's the way I think um, architecture can come much closer to the to the manufacturing process, because the the um, the supporting algorithms and logic that link those two allow the, uh, a much greater de um, degree of flexibility for design for design, um, without um, without all of the constraints of uh, this kind of mass production, which is part of the previous era. Um, so you know, UAP works on um, every one of our projects is slightly different. So it's difficult to um, reap the benefits of a mass customized outcome in the context of art. But when we're doing large scale um, architectural work, there's uh, where you might be looking at a, like the Queen Street Mall facade or something at that scale, then there's a lot of opportunity to um, tweak and tune the algorithms that drive uh, uh, the benefits of mass production and, and then all the benefits of uh, combined with the benefits of a very flexible design constraint. So, um, uh, yeah, I think the future looks very, very different to the 1970s box thing and um, and that's where I think architecture and I think the, the world the worlds of architecture and disruptive technology have, have a lot of work to do in that space. That's where the future's at. One thing that I'd, I'd like to bring up, Lisa, you just touched on this 
the idea when, when we think about or when we talk about construction, uh, I guess there's an assumption that we're talking about new construction with the huge increase in, in existing building stock that, that we're, um, we're living with, soon that's about to change and it's going to change presumably quite, quite quickly but also in, in, in light of the increasing cost of materials and uh, of depleting resource. I'd, I'd like each of you to talk about how you see the future of our cities shaping up when we're potentially going to be doing a lot more um, retrofitting, adaptive reuse, um, both from the point of view of being responsible with the way that we generate less waste, but uh, can be smarter about how we can use existing buildings. And that obviously can happen at every scale. So perhaps, Lockie, would you like to talk a little bit about the way that, that you guys in your, your practice might work with recycled materials or recycling building mm. components or, or adapting things in a, in a kind of a smart way because we're all, all, we're all going to have to start working a lot more earnestly in, in using resources um, more responsibly. Yeah, definitely. I think the last 18 months or two years for us has been really exciting because COVID's one thing, but then Airbnb has been a big factor in residential design as well and sort of multiple houses or units within one site and, 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 and people working from home now. So for us in residential design, it's completely, it's almost becoming very flexible. Like we're doing projects where we set up gridded structures and try to keep all the plumbing to edges and try to keep the floor plates actually clean, so to speak, with no bracing walls in between so that we can often, we'll often give a client sort of three house designs and say this is a, a granny flat or an Airbnb at the front. It could be a five bedroom house, it could be a four bedroom house. You could potentially not do this bay at the back. You could, and so we're, we're it's, it's quite interesting because you can, Obviously, we have to talk to engineers and then we actually get them on board earlier because we need to know what the spans can work and where we can set up the grid and what works with the bracing wall and whether we can actually get the components to work. But it's, it is interesting, the flexibility, like offices at home now and mm -hmm. separate entrances and, and it's changed actually the way housing is going to probably progress and I, it's probably ne never going back to where it was. Um, so that flexibility is a really interesting, the flexibility of how many people live on the site and what, whether there's different family units is really... So you're designing new buildings to be able to be adapted over time. You're yeah. thinking differently even about mm. new buildings. But in terms of reuse, like we've got projects too where we're starting to work in areas that maybe 10, 15 years ago you thought we would knock some of these project homes and we're starting to see projects now come in from 1980s and early 90s housing stock, brick veneer, tiled roof um, projects that, that it's just not feasible to knock them. Yeah. And so we're actually re, I don't know, renovating A.B. Jennings style houses <laughs> and that. And, and, and it's, it's been, it's like, you know, at the start, you do, you, I think as designers too, you sort of go, well, there's an opportunity to knock this house and get on with something better, but mm. the, it's either the budget or they actually like certain components mm. of the house, they understand the house, they understand the site, they understand the passive elements of it. Some of them aren't actually as bad as what we all think. Um, they're often quite not mean, but they, they, you know, there's 2,400 ceilings, they're, they're brick veneer, but they're actually quite flexible houses and they're just as flexible as, as Queenslanders per se. And we're starting to do work on them and, and it's actually quite interesting. And it sort of feels like we're not just bowling these suburbs over, like they've been established 25 years ago and now, you know, there is this erasure happening in some of these areas where they're, you know, they're just bowling it and then the housing stock is almost like the lowest denominator of materials and building methods and, and there's no craft, there's no bespoke and, yeah. and there's no flexibility. It's the biggest house on the biggest block but um, I kind of feel like some of those are becoming really quite 
quite interesting. Yeah, no, that sounds very exciting. Um, and presumably there's also the existing landscape on the site. Definitely. So yeah. it, it's not just the, the building itself, but mm. um, being able to really see that genuine value, I think we probably will all see a revaluing of existing building stock and existing landscape as, as a relative cost of construction for new builds increases at the speed it is now, that's for sure. Matt, oh, I think Lachlan hit the nail on the head because <laughs> there's a lot of talk over the last 12 months about cities and the death of cities, but the, cities is, the city is humankind's greatest invention and we've got all this stock, whether it's an office building or a shopping centre or an A.V. Jennings home at Ginger Lee, um, I think we're going to repurpose it. There's no doubt about that because the cost of labour is very high now, only going to get higher. Uh, we're going through, I know the cost of debt's very low, but, but we are in a really interesting point at the moment. We, mm -hmm. we don't have enough people to build what we want built, and if they are available to build it, they're going to charge you a lot of money, which is not, for a lot of people, commercially possible. Mm -hmm. So I think we're in a fantastic position. We own buildings like the Blue Tower and the Gold Tower, which are now 40 and 45 years old, and they're still very, very good. But we, we, we're getting five and a half star neighbours ratings out of these buildings. So the stock, we've got this great stock. We know what we can do to make it environmentally relevant. And I think we can also we can make it design relevant and we can also make it commercially relevant. So I, I, I'm pretty excited about mm. what cities can do, and I, I'm really fascinated with what Lachlan's saying about, you know, the, 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 what were once the outer suburbs of Brisbane, which are really now the middle ring, I think people are genuinely looking at these sort of houses and saying there are some benefits in them. Let's let's not knock it over, let's repurpose it. The same with office buildings, the same with shopping centres, the same with even industrial property now. Um, mm. Great opportunity and um, I think you're going to see a lot of repurposing going on without a lot of rebuilding. Mm -hmm. And. Um the technology that both you were talking about, Ben and and Lisa, how do you see, for example, obviously, Ben, you're building, you know, at, at any one time you're probably putting a new facade onto a building, um, or putting a, you know, a, a, a public artwork, um, either integrated into the building or, you know, out the front of the building where you might actually have to really go in there and, and understand that site you've been using technology such as scanning and so on do you see that the technology that we have in construction is actually going to enable us to be more sensitive and more effective in going in and retrofitting buildings and and can we actually use the the more sophisticated technology in terms of you know, really precise um, kind of mass customization to go in and very specifically adapt to what might be either a you know a, a building that's been built 50 years ago and it's it's not you know there's no regular grid or things are built out you know out of whack do you see technology having a, a kind of a, a role in being able to change the way that we can reuse existing structure yeah I mean um you know, the buildings we're working on in New York, uh, um, there's a huge repurposing movement happening. It's a, it's a, you know, I don't know what percentage of the market it is currently, but it's a really big percentage. And so, and, and a lot of those buildings are very old. So, um, and you, you were talking about scanning technology. That's a huge um, uh, new field of, of tech that is actually getting um, more, more broadly used every year. There's a um, steel firm that we work with that uh, uses it almost exclusively. So they don't site measure anything more, they just take a, a really dense point cloud or whatever, they're, um, whatever they have to fix to. And um, they're finding that um, they're able to really clarify, um, not, only, not only that they're able to build very accurately to what exists on site, but they're able to clarify um, whose fault it is. So it, it serves a few purposes. Um, but I think also, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a really big responsibility for all of us to focus on the materials we're using. And so, and it's really hard to do because uh, um, it's hard to fight that commercial uh, in, imperative. 
And so um, we're really actively looking for materials that are, you know, cyclical in, in nature, you know, that we can recycle or that already are recycled and it, it's not easy. Mm. And so um, what, I th what I think we have to all do is just really consciously push for that every day because they don't fall in your lap. So we're doing this great little um, uh, project at the moment with a company called Five Mile Radius and um, they're a great little prison firm but they uh, utilise, the, there's always a concrete truck left over with six cubes of concrete in it. So they um, get it delivered to their workshop and they try to make stuff out of it, which is really um, cool and hard to, uh, it's kind of hard to, ex uh, to really expand on that model because it's so sporadic. Um, but, but a company like UAP has got access to ways to kind of um, find the markets for that product. So, so just re being really active about trying to focus on materials that are reusable or can be recycled in the future. Is a big part of what we're doing and you know um, it costs money to work with recycled material that's the, the sad thing about it yeah. but I think technology can help to alleviate that cost. Mm. Mm. Lisa I know some of the work that uh, you're involved in uh, you're actually looking at designing structures that can be dismantled in a way that can allow the, the structure to be repurposed um, without sacrificial demolition is a really interesting way that this technology is advancing. Can you talk a little bit more about the work that you're doing in that field? Yeah, um, so the work was sort of inspired by uh, a project which has now been finished in, the, in Europe which was called Buildings as Material Banks where not only do you make things to last you actually think about the inherent value of those materials and not only in terms of cost but also um, the environmental footprint that's tied to that so it's sort of like a very holistic approach of looking at the the cost of making things and if that's how you treat buildings you would want to be able to fix them maintain them so within a circular economy framework, that would be the first thing that you want to do is keep things in use. And we see that, that actually a lot with um, you know, all the buildings that, that were really well made mm. and um, the you know, timber hard, hardwood floor was fantastic in, yeah. in Queenslanders. And we're trying to incorporate that then in design that we say we don't only do design for manufacture and assembly, but also deconstruction. So we're adding the extra D to DFMA. DFMA plus D is what we call it at the moment, or what it's called in literature. So you think about how can I make a, um, a product that's um, repairable, maintainable, but can also be pulled apart, reconfigured, moved, and then um, set up again to serve um, the same function or a completely different function. And then trace that all the way to the end of life and still be able to then dismantle that and um, separa separate the materials, recycle some of them, direct reuse of some, downcycle some others. So a good example would be um, a panelized wall where we have clip-on facade elements um, and we know that those get probably uh, changed uh, quicker than the structural elements so so we use really good timber materials that will la last 50 years and we know that they do. Um, we will have uh, a facade that we say okay that's maybe going to last if, if we um, uh, take good care of it um, 15 to 30 years depending on the materials and then internal wall lin lining stable change inevitably. But the structure at its core is going to be intact and sound. And then we use reversible connection details between those panels so that we can take a whole building apart, move it some other place, set it up again. And that's becoming more and more important with um, you know, climate change, uh, parts that are now flood zoned, where we have a lot of buildings that aren't insurable. Uh, infill spaces or spaces that have only temporary use 
um, and we know a lot of our coastal zones are probably those kind of spaces where, where we might have to retreat gradually more and more as, as um, the oceans claim them back. But also uh, bushfire prone areas where, you know, we, we, it, it might just not be a, um, a space to have something necessarily for a very long time, but you might be using a, a space for, say, a couple, couple of years and then you remove it again. So that's sort of the thinking in layers and building um, a product in layers where every part has a different function, it has got its service life attached to it, um, and it has all the specifications, which is really great, you know, with um, with BIM and all the technologies we've got available, we can give this, um, every part, um, basically a signature. So what, what it's called, again, in, in that research area is a material passport. So you know where it was sourced, sustainably sourced, you know what it's been through, you know what the remaining specification and service life is, and then you can uh, re-specify that in, in that way accordingly. So what you might do at the very end of life, at the, of the building, say if your panel has gone through a couple of use cycles, it's been in the school, it's been in, in a, you know, in a, um, uh, single store, um, you know, single family detached home. It might have been part of a multi-story project um, that was an infill space for a couple of years before something else was developed. Okay, so it's been say t through three or four use cycles, and now we can still go and say um, these are the parts that we will now, um, you know, recycle. Um, but you can say my uh, my stud framing is still perfectly fine because we've traced that panel through the uh, entire uh, through its entire life, and we can then refurbish that. And worst case, at the end of life, uh, we could still make something new out of it, uh, chipboard, whatever. So so I think if you, it's kind of ironic because that's how we used to make things. Right, so that's how our grandparents' generation used to make things. Things that last, but things that can be repaired and then have been refurbished and have been, um, have been reused for other purposes. But we just have to embrace that again and rediscover that mindset. It's really a mindset. It's very different from the way how a lot of things have been designed. Um, because you, again, have to think about it holistically, really long term. Yeah, no, it is a mi mindset, and it is, it's also the, the way that you think about design, it really, in a way, it's a, it is a, a way to think about design. We might take the opportunity now to invite questions from the, the audience, and I think we're going to have a microphone. Do we need the microphone? If we might need it. Yeah, okay. So if anyone would like to ask questions of our, of our panel, please do. Um, I was just wondering if uh, Lisa and Ben as well probably um, most uh, relevant to you guys, but you spoke a lot about the flexibility that um, automation and, and those new technologies have brought to design. I wonder if you um, have found that there's also limitations as far as the way that they limit your practice or they limit the things that you design, um, you know, certain elements of Revit come to mind, for example, that kind of have produced a very specific outcome that you don't have control over. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys have come across that and if you have taken measures to counteract it, especially when it comes to things like this work design. Do you want me to go Well, I can, I can talk um, uh, briefly about um, uh, that, because it is a really interesting question. It's like the maths controlling design, right? And, and so there's this... Um, there's this generative aesthetic that I think is going to date our era. And, and um, so I'm actually in the process of, of, of founding a new business that is really um, about uh, taking the same logic and, and mathematics that drives the productivity, but somehow pushing that, making it more the servant of the creative process rather than the driver of the creative process. So I just think that's the next iteration of what we have to work on. and. Um, I just think the um, aesthetic that's coming out of the, 
the gener you know the degenerative uh, technology is just a moment in time, and so um, so uh, you know my my new business will be very much focused on that. We're trying to create I'm trying to create a sculptural process to drive the mathematics, and so the maths is hidden from the designer. Mm. Mm. It's a really cool field. I guess just sort of the structural perspective on that is it's absolutely true what you're saying. A lot of the um, software that a structural engineer would use is very much limited to slabs and columns and beams. And as soon as something's not 90 degrees, it starts to get a little bit more interesting. Um, and I think a lot of that, I, I like to be inspired by everyday objects or you know nature and then it comes back to actually a hand sketch and a hand calculation of whether something's feasible or not so I think let's not throw all those tools away that people used to use um, in in this design process um, a good example is you know um, uh, hanging chains and, and how forces act through a structure and I think it's really, really important as those new tools emerge for us to still educate our young designers and engineers and teach them those methods and that craft um, of doing doing those things out so that they're not limited to what's possible in the software. But I think, as, um, as Ben was saying, it's probably just a matter of time until we're um, in a space where mm. the tools help us more than they limit us, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. Definitely coming though. <laughs> yes. Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, Lisa was talking about a new design course at UQ to bring design back into architecture and engineering, if I could paraphrase you perhaps badly. Um, and, um, why was that, I guess the first part is, why is that not simply called architecture? Anyway, and what happened? That somehow that's fallen off the, uh, off the cart somewhere. And um, similarly, I'm trying to draw a parallel to the idea that um, timber design used to be called joinery and even building once, and that also fell off the cart. So to what extent do you see this uh, rather than finding new design uh, institutions or new design ways, um, is there a way of looking at this as a, uh, as a retrospective reinstatement rather than simply a, a new adding more and more design um, elements to a process that goes forward? Is that there's probably, yeah, there's probably a few questions in that one. Um, um, so, look, perhaps the, the first part of that question, Lisa, I guess, was was pointed to perhaps the way that you might be uh, teaching students. We we do we do have some new courses now and yeah. new programs where you are bringing students yeah. together. So, so, I, so Lisa, so I think to just try and simplify myself. Um, I'm talking about this schism between design mm. and actually making stuff, and that once those two things were more um, married. Yeah, I think so because it's, I guess, a several part question. Um, the uh, I for the Bachelor of Design, I would probably refer to Cameron as well, <laughs> who's in in the room, who can probably answer that a lot better than. Um, myself, but I think you you really actually you hit the nail on the head there with um, it's it's actually I, I would say it's almost the renaissance of what used to happen where we kind of going back to um, teaching students to think more holistically. It's because we have been so specialized, or I, I guess the trend has been for. Um, for everything in the world really to become more and more specialised and in depth we're kind of trying to bring bring it back together to see the bigger picture um, and to answer I guess I can probably answer best in the space of timber engineering 
that was not a course. We are we are the only university in all of Australia who teaches structural timber engineering, a pure dedicated structural timber engineering course. Um, and it's been lost. It was very we were world leading in the seventies and eighties, and it's gotten you know somehow forgotten other materials were more popular so it's really coming back to some simple materials that we you know it's kind of the oldest and the newest building material really um, but I guess as there are more new tools new methods of construction engineered wood products there is a little bit added there that didn't exist back in the day when it was only joinery so so I guess um, I guess the focus is really on teaching those more advanced theories, methods, materials, etc., that we wouldn't have used back when we made the first Queenslanders. But at the same time, seeing the bigger picture of there's more to a structure than the, just the structural elements which most structural engineers think, and then they get very confused when they realize they're building services <laughs> and, you know, a, a fabric. And, and um, so, yeah, I, I don't know that I answered that perfectly, but I think if you are curious about the design stream, then probably, I don't, I don't know if Cameron would like to comment. No, I, I, I think your comment about specialization is really the key, is that, um, I would observe that we've made a very good siloed world in many respects, whether it's in architecture or engineering, and we've become better and better and better at that at a time when actually what the world wants us is, is a connected, de-siloed world. And so the task that you're talking about in terms of education in, in architecture or engineering is about how we deconstruct these mechanisms through which we've organised ourselves right through to the level of legislation um, and accrediting frameworks, etc., which does present a very significant challenge in, in professional education. Thanks, Cameron. Other questions from the audience? Just a question for the um, So, your recent sort of work has been um, in bushfire prone areas. I was wondering, um, do you think this sort of aesthetic will sort of shape? the construction industry and your work, for example, so if you think about this, do you think this, this has like, uh, the direction of um, urban housing? Uh, and, uh, do you see it as a sort of solution, in a way, uh, to these contractual problems that you're having, that you mentioned earlier, in terms of cost? Like, do you see this material as a solution, for example, reducing the cost of building? I definitely think it helps. Like the bushfire is, is a very, no one really knows whether the, the bushfire code works yet. Like we, you know, like it, it's very, it, it is interesting. Like it, um, we're talking a lot more with engineers. We're talking a lot more with fire engineers. We're talking a lot more with civil engineers in residential projects. Like, you know, it happens in bigger scale projects, but for houses, it never was really something that was sort of so, um, you, you know, you had to, you had to engage these people really early on, and, and, and it's about you know timber sills and embers sitting on sills and mesh and screens and this sort of skirt around the building. But so a lot of these codes are informing how we're designing and how we're assembling things, which is which I I, I really like. I think it's just sort of enhancing the architecture. But it's not about battling these codes. It's about accepting. Okay, we're in a bushfire area. It is BAL 40, um, and we're trying to learn from it and then try to adapt how these houses or how you inhabit, like it doesn't matter if it's a house or a whatever it is, but how we inhabit some of these landscapes that we probably never really used to, like, you, you know, so the Victorian fires and some of the other ones that have been over the last couple of years, they're implementing these sort of rolling bushfire codes now. And as one certifier said to us the other day, we don't know until the next fire goes through an area that's been burnt and we've put all these, so all this BAL 40 and whatever, they, they, they actually don't even know if it works yet. They're, they're assuming, and then there's design guidelines, but it's great. It, like I, I think from a, you know, instead of just doing 
a house for someone, we're now doing a house for the site in the conditions with trying to maintain landscape. Like it, there was a period there we just used to wipe a whole suburb of gum trees and then come back in, put houses in and put some golden palm sort of houses back in. And then, and then that sort of, it, it's not, it's not being accepted as widely anymore. And so it's sort of saying, okay, well, maybe these materials and, and, and there is resistance, there's social resistance from, you know, anywhere you go in the world, like uh, I, I worked in Ireland and, and doing rendered walls was not seen as, you know, it was, it was much, much better to, in Ireland to have face brick and then in Brisbane it was that there's a period where face brick wasn't sort of seen to be, and, and it's sort of, you know, it's interesting how some of the social trends with materiality is changing as well and, and that's great too, but um, yeah, no, the bushfire stuff is definitely, definitely interesting and, and it's informing how we're, you know, like it, it's sort of giving us rhyme and reason to inhabiting some of these sort of um, landscapes. It'll, it'll be interesting to see, like I, I don't wish a fire to come through these areas, but it will be interesting to see whether inhabiting some of these landscapes actually is not possible. Well, interestingly, when we were delivering the, when we were getting the QFERS approval for the timber office building that we built in the prison showgrounds, there's a real predictability of that timber. When it is on fire, like the fire department knows what's going to happen, as opposed to concrete and steel, where it's very unpredictable. So, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, they did, did set the bar very high, but they were very interested and they thought this was a material that could be you know, could become, you know, something that could be used ubiquitously. Like, yeah. it, it, it's not, you know, every time we took a tent through, they said, oh, tell us about the fire. Is this thing going to burn down? But, and, and it was just a great story about it. It's like, it was like, it was better, it was a better fire retardant than concrete, actually. Yeah, so, right. and I'm sure you're having those discussions yeah. in, in bushfire prone areas as well. It's a, it's a great material that I think the fire departments know what, what happens when it does set a lot. Mm -hmm. We probably have time for about two more questions. We've got, got to finish up by 7.30 I believe. Is that right Isabella? So a couple more questions from the audience. Present, and, uh, uh, I thought something that might have come up would be that we might be now designing and building buildings that would have uh, a shorter time life, mm -hmm. like a short life that you uh, because we might want to have a, a different type of building on the side. And is that not the case? Because you mentioned a couple of things that were about, you know, repurposing or actually, um, you know, the, the buildings seem to be having a long life and you know, they would be repurposed again by this idea of designing a building for a shorter life. Is that, is that something that we come across in you know, the architecture we want? I've, I've never heard a client with that question, but it's a great question. I, I, I like the idea, like, but it, it's not, I don't know if it's tied to economics and then, and, you know, the sort of, you know, the costs associated with getting any type of building on site, and whether it's temporary or permanent and building certifiers and all these codes, but it's a great question. <laughs> I, I, I actually, Pl yeah. planning, planning plays a big part in all that, obviously. You've got a residential house in a residential suburb to convert it to an industrial shed. It's going to be tough. But I think in the CBD, we've seen that over the last 25 years, we've seen a lot of office buildings converted to student accommodation, to hotels, to apartments. I think we'll continue to see that, and that's the beauty of some of the stock, especially that stock that's built in the 60s and 70s and 80s, engineering-wise, absolutely. Probably over-engineered. Mm -hmm and great opportunities to retrofit them. But I think at the smaller scale, mm. we're quite, you'll know better than yeah. I, but we're not on that journey yet. But at the big scale, absolutely, there is this idea. And those things, what's to say that those things don't come back in 20 years time? You know, at the moment we don't have any international students. So our institutional owners of these buildings thinking, oh my God, when do I get them back? If I don't get them back, do I need to convert it back, for example? So. I suppose that's an interesting thing at scale, but not on the, not on the small end. I don't think at the minute. Mm -hmm. Was that question geared around the lifespan of the material? 
in the building or just the building in general? There was an example maybe in Sydney where it was a sporting stadium that hadn't been really around for maybe maybe two decades and they were Mm. thinking about tearing it down. Mm. So I think I think with that inju- um, environmental environmentally justifiable lifespan or basically life cycle impact assessment comes into play, and if we did that more, it's actually it is actu- actually in a few countries in Europe you have to have a life cycle assessment of your building before you can build it, depending on the scale as well, and I think that's the answer to the question if you're building something out of a material that is that has a huge environmental footprint, you better use that to justify using that material. So I think part of the answer to that question could be make it in a way that it can last the 50 years you've specified um, or, or use materials of, of the quality that will last those 50 years specified but design it in a, in a way that it can be adapted over and over again. Well, look, I think that's a good note to finish on. If we um, can imagine that we're, we're designing buildings that are future-proof, I think that's um, something that we can look forward to. I mean, these challenges that we've just spoken about in terms of adaptation and being more flexible and more responsible, they, they are they're challenges, but they're exciting. So um, I think it's certainly something that I am excited about as a designer. Things are going to change for us. and. Um, Looks like there'll be uh, an interesting road uh, in the future. I um, just wanted to say thank you to Isabella for organising this evening's session. And uh, I believe we have to wrap up and, and do we have to be out of here soon? What's the next we part can, of the We can meeting? take our time, but yeah. yeah, we'll conclude the conversation. And, you know, thank you so much, Kim. That was an incredibly well facilitated and engaging conversation. And thank you to Cameron for allowing us to be in this you know, beautiful new space that I think we'll kind of see many more conversations like this in the future as well. So I just want to say thank you to, to Lisa, to Ben, Matt and Lockie. We can all give them a round of applause.